have entered the aqua brain i'm your virgil drew on today's show we're going to talk goats we're going to talk herbs we're going to talk farming my next guest she's a pro she's a teacher she's a healer she's a goat wrangler welcome to the show sasha sajitek sasha how in the hell are you hanging in there how are you good good thanks for joining me so where do you teach and what do you teach and can you tell me a little bit about the program yeah so i'm the program manager of agroecology at hawking college which is a small two-year technical college in southeastern ohio so a lot of people have heard of ohio university which is the main college in the athens area and hawking is just um about 15 minutes north in nelsonville and okay. the agroecology program is well i guess i should say the study of agroecology <clears throat> is basically agriculture based on um how the farm as an ecosystem fits into the natural ecosystem as a whole in whatever bioregion you're in lots of principles of permaculture um and biology and sort of figuring out how technology fits in with that too in a lot of ways and um economies of scale i'm trying to help my students understand a lot about that too um it, that's basically it so so it it does have a lot of permaculture uh aspects to it it uh, does it does it's a lot of um perennial polycultures and understanding how biodiversity is really necessary and a real strength in agriculture because we don't have a lot of that right now um you know with all the monocrops of corn and soy and wheat throughout most of our country so what would you say is the main difference or the added kind of flavor of, of agroecology in general basically looking at the farm as a whole ecosystem uh it's not about just growing one or two things it's about understanding how everything you can grow sort of um it gives you multiple avenues for income on a farm but then the like i said the biodiversity is really your strength because let's say it's a bad year for your veggie crops but your orchard may be taking off and doing really well so at least you've got you know your pears and your apples or uh different sorts of berries gotcha. you can fall back on which are a higher dollar crop anyways um and because your orchard's been doing really well you know it might be because you've been running broiler chickens through it so you've got you know several hundred broiler chickens that you could be um getting ready to process and sell too so it's just it's maintaining that biodiversity and realizing you're not just there to farm one thing but that you're really sort of the caretaker of an ecosystem that's excellent man i I've, I've been following that for a few years and i i think that it's great i think it's it's awesome I, my my main problem where i am in in boise is i just wasn't able to get a large enough chunk of land to that i felt like i could really do that um also kind of limited in in what i can can have we can't have uh like roosters for instance um mm -hmm. in the city limits well, you don't need so. roosters to have chicken thankfully <laughs> right <laughs> but space um, but i guess yeah well you'd be surprised there's a lot of urban permaculture books out there uh you can fit a lot onto a small acreage if you plan it out right and account for what the you know mature growth of all of your plants are going to be um but there's a lot of folks that just do i mean you obviously know anthony and his yeah massive tiny garden right. uh polyculture plot but i mean that's a good example of what can be done just in an, a suburban urban setting so right now you don't I need think, a ton of land you can still grow food yeah well i think the 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 main thing that you you mentioned is planning like you can't mm -hmm. you can't just you you really have to plan out what am i going to put where and then certain things maybe don't work and so you have to kind of do an audible and and uh kind of move some things around um for me i i put in a couple of raised beds um and so i'm kind of baby steps getting there i've got a, a berry bed which has strawberries and blueberries well, that's great. and uh that's great and like a there's a patch that uh that i just put some wild native wildflowers seed in there and so that was just kind of like my 
my pollinator patch. And so I'm just, just working, you know, like slow, slowly, but surely. Um, That's a great start. Yeah, definitely. And I, you know, I would love to turn my front yard into something because I think it's a lot of wasted space. Um, so I've, so I've been working on killing the grass and so I think it's officially <laughs> dead. So, so my, my neighborhood, uh, it's a, it's a bunch of green, 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 green. And then ours is like brown. So it's, <laughs> it's nice. I, I feel accomplished yeah. there. Um, so, so you're also into wild crafting. Um, yeah. Yeah. How, I've been an herbalist longer than I've been a farmer. Yeah. And I, I was going to talk about, definitely ask you about herbalism too, because, um, I feel like it's, it's, it seems to be a primarily, uh, would it, would it be fair to say it's, it's primarily a female driven thing or, um, do you see, see a lot of guys getting into it and, and where were I think they? nowadays there's, there are plenty of men. Um, it's pr pretty well balanced. Um, okay. I think the, the, the tradition of it was primarily very female because um, you sort of look at the evolution of like medical history and stuff and how women weren't really allowed into school for a mm -hmm. long time. So all of their knowledge was handed down from their mothers and grandmothers. So there's just like very That's matrilineal history of just knowing how to take care of your family mm. to like you like you were saying like how do i treat my family how do what yeah. do i do for a boo-boo like what do i do when someone has a sore throat like um it infection. was always exactly it was always the women's place to take care of those things so um a lot of that knowledge got passed down along matrilineal lines and a lot of men would go to become doctors which you know they were doing crazy stuff like bloodletting and injecting <laughs> yeah, mercury leeches. into people's That's penises right. to cure syphilis and stuff and it was just yeah. like they thought they had the science down so for so long they were just like no we're right we're gonna do this this is you just you midwives and whatnot you go you know play with your plants and stuff so for a long time i would say it was primarily female i mean you see a little bit um different um dynamic when you get into more indigenous tribes where um medicine people were male female two-spirit they you know their gender spectrum was all over the place so it was just like right. if you had the gift you did it um but i think in mostly very like white european culture it was a very female-based thing but now no it's great um Paul Strauss is an amazing herbalist of Equinox Botanicals, and he started the United Plant Savers with a Golden Seal Botanical Sanctuary down here in Rutland, and he's an awesome herbalist. He knows so much. Um, Stephen Herod Buner is really great. He's, gosh, his writing is so technical, and he, I mean, there's like clinical herbalism, which gets, gets really into the chemistry and uh, of everything, and um, Michael Wood is another great guy herbalist. <laughs> So they're, yeah. they're, they're out there. <laughs> so I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to, I think I asked that question a little bit wrong. I, I didn't mean it. Oh no, that's fine. I didn't mean it in like, Hey, is it okay if guys get into this? I was yeah. just wondering from, from a, cause I know there's like, I've been looking into, okay, well there's clinical, there's like the people that grow and manufacture and, and there's different levels of herbalism. And I'm wondering, Much. I guess my question was, coming from a man would it be m more or less i don't know is there like a stigma like i i don't uh, if i'm gonna go to an herbalist i want to go to a woman i i guess that was kind of where my my question was was leading but um i'm all over the place <laughs> so it's okay <laughs> i'd say i mean i'd say go go wherever you're comfortable for the most part i i tend to go to female doctors because i'm identify as a female and I have female body parts and I feel like somebody with those same body parts would understand me better or understand if I'm describing a symptom or an issue they're like oh I've heard of this or oh I've experienced this myself so you you might feel more comfortable with a male herbalist in that identifying as male and whatnot because it's somebody that could probably understand the things you're describing better if it has to do with something um 
And that yeah. makes a lot of sense. That makes an awful lot of sense. Um, something that, something that I was kind of drawn to and I, cause I, so I'm reading this pamphlet that was basically like an 80 page thing that one of the herbal schools puts out for free download. That's like, here, get, you know, get, get prepared for what, you know, what all the, hopefully we're going to answer all your questions. And I, I don't know the name of the school off the top of my head, but, um, and I'm reading through it and I just keep thinking, you know, how cool would it be to go and study what some of the indigenous peoples around the world, but you know, around my area used. And so yeah. have you, have you heard of any schools or, um, are there any, like any, anything that you've heard of that that's like that, that would be a good place to start potentially? I, well, no, um, and, for, and this is sort of a big, I guess, um, I've, I've read some things on Instagram, I'll say about this. There's, yeah. so when, when settlers and colonizers came, they broke up the lineage by sending so many indigenous people off to, um, oh gosh, I'm, drawing a total blank of the name of the type of schools they sent them to but they took them off the reservation they sent them to white schools and like basically took all of their right? yeah and they, they broke that lineage of of knowledge so a lot of indigenous people don't because the indigenous people living today i feel like it's mostly their um their parents and grandparents generation um got sent to those schools and they didn't get handed down that knowledge like they should have so um a lot of folks have been saying like if you have herbal knowledge and if you if you if you teach and you make money off of this knowledge and you're a white person living in america you should be teaching um black and indigenous people of color this information for free uh, which oh, okay. i completely agree with because it was okay. taken from them and in a lot of cases like that whole culture is is very appropriated right now um when you think about white sage smudge sticks and things like that uh not only is it sort of an endangered species at this point but that's not it's not a traditional european plant um it's not something that we would have brought with us when we colonized this land to to use in our own cultural herbal heritage, right? It's something that yeah. we sort of took. Okay. Um, and in the same way, like, uh, I wish there was indigenous herbal, and there might be that I just don't know about. Um, but I think that that's, that resource is so lacking because of what was done and because of um, how many of those children were taken away from their, their parents and grandparents and they were never, you know, allowed to learn that knowledge. So. So how do you, how do you yeah, feel? A lot of what I know, oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say a lot of what I know. Yeah. And I think a lot of what other, um, as a white herbalist would know is, um, a lot of the European herbs that, that settlers brought with them. Um, and there are a lot of native things around here, like yarrow, um, bone set, we think self heal, um, all a lot of the trees sassafras obviously um white oak bark cherry bark things like that that are native that we've learned about but it's only through the grace and kindness of whatever indigenous people took pity on us and taught somebody to yeah. begin with yeah. um and then you know we were able to pass that down but it is really sad that you know our our white lineage was able to hold on to that and it was really kept from indigenous populations so. yeah and that you know and so i'm i'm really up against it because i'm i'm not you know i my family has been here for a long time but i'm czechoslovakian and german and a european mix so i'm i'm definitely not an indigenous people and i i don't have as far as i know i don't have any percentage um in my in my heritage but it's something that you know i've always loved the mountains and everything and it's uh you know my wife makes a funny comment like she thinks i was uh i was 
black in a in a previous life because there's there's certain things that I really like that she's just like yeah you must have that that's somewhere in you you know and I've always yeah, felt where did, really where'd that come from yeah who knows but um and that's definitely a a path I I I didn't really want to go down I I don't even know what I think about that but uh <laughs> but I I feel a connection to the land even though you know I wasn't originally you know maybe anywhere in my blood is was originally here um but sage is actually one of my favorite like I and living in Boise when you go outside of Boise or even some places in Boise and that natural sagebrush and that smell for some reason like just I, I love it. I don't <laughs> now, yeah, and I and I don't it's think it's intoxicating. And I don't think that's the same as the white smudge sticks. Um, I think that's a different. Oh no, you can right? you can definitely appreciate and you know love an herb and and appreciate it in its natural habitat by all means. Yeah, but I it's mean, like, yeah, I just wouldn't go collecting a whole bunch of it, and make smudge sticks, and <laughs> sell them for however much on Etsy. <laughs> yeah, I mean and that was another thing I guess uh that I found found really interesting was that um the the processing of the plants and potentially even the growing. I don't know I if I've gotten that far but growing herbs and and making medicine from herbs is highly regulated. But then to the clinical part is like no license, no nothing, you're just you can do it if you, if people trust you enough to, which I find very interesting. And maybe I'm getting that wrong, but it seems like you could just, if you're a, a good enough BS artist, <laughs> you could be a clinical herbalist and it would be like, you know, but if you actually want the medicine, like I love Arnica, Arnica is like magical, right? Um, it is. Uh, although poisonous everybody so just keep that in mind but um like don't eat the oil well take it internally it is but yeah, yeah. no just um, rub it on unbroken skin oh man <laughs> and it's like i just i i sing its praises but uh yeah so anyway let's let's uh let's get off the herbalism for a little bit and pivot to something else goats because I know that's something that you're passionate about. So tell me about your, do you own goats or is that through the school? And- Oh, I what, own goats. <laughs> what, got you, what got you into goats? Uh, so when I lived in Austin, I, uh, that's where I took my permaculture design certification. Uh, and it was in like 2007. And then I moved back to Ohio in 2008, but learning about um, creating these like, perennial polyculture systems that you could like, sort of turn into silvo pasture and like run your animals through. I was like, this is genius, right? Yeah. Um, and based on my like sort of natural health background and herbalism and stuff and learning about the Weston A. Price Foundation and raw milk and um, just understanding like basically raw goat milk is a superfood and it's it can do a lot of healing for a lot of people if it works with your body well. Um, it worked with mine well. I was like, shoot, I want goats so I can have my own raw goat milk. Yeah. And then I moved back to Athens, Ohio to help um, care for my grandparents. And because I knew I wanted to farm. Um, long story short, <laughs> I, after moving out of my grandparents' home, um, I got in with some other permaculture friends and we ended up moving into an abandoned farmhouse that we sort of half squatted with permission and then built a yurt at the place that um i wanted to work was just a mile around the corner and it was a goat dairy oh, nice. um and they made cheese they still make cheese integration acres um and do a whole bunch of they also do a bunch of wild crafting with uh, pawpaw and black walnuts and ramps and spice bush and Ooh, black walnuts they've got a really great yeah, they've got a really great diversified um, sort of production stream going and uh, they needed a goat milker. And I was like, sweet, I want to work with goats. Um, and after about a year or so working there, I brought some goats home to the yurt before I had a full on farm. 
I was like, I'm just, I'm going to raise goats. And I had a bunch of boys that I was, I raised up for meat and then two girls uh, that I, that I was going to raise and start a dairy with. So that was uh, maybe 10 years ago. Wow. -ish. So awesome. yeah, I've, I've now I'm up to, let me see. I had 25 goats and a sheep. And then I just gave my friend two. She, um, she and her husband are so kind. They are helping homeschool my daughter while uh, her dad and I are both working full time during the yeah, day. That's, that's you know, fantastic. We didn't want to send her back in person yeah. and whatnot, but she's with her buddies in a little pod. Um, and they're also farmers. And I was like, you guys want two goats uh, in payment for wow. helping with my child? And Perfect. thankfully they said yes. So Gosh, it's been that. a great bartering tool. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I raised British Guernseys, which are uh, a rare heritage breed. So there's a lot of them over on the Isle of Guernsey in England, but there's not so many here in America. But we're working on getting the population high enough that they, um, they're working on the American Dairy Goat Association sort of accept, accepting them into the herd books and stuff, getting them on the roster, if you will, as an official American breed. Wow, so. that's very cool. I also cool. started very raising cool. meat goats last year yeah i'm gonna go next weekend actually um i'll be picking up a myotonic buck those are the ones that um the fainting goats that everyone talks okay, about but okay people in the know will call them myotonics because it's um <laughs> a genetic deformation that basically causes them to stiffen up when they get scared but all of that like muscle stiffening will actually build muscle um and okay. they've got the best meat to bone ratio of any goat so oh wow yeah, I'm going to get one of those and half my herd is going to be for meat and the other half is going to be for dairy. Cool. Now, are you, um, are you selling this stuff? Uh, do you have a, do you have a website or, or anything like that? Or is it all? I'm, I'm not techy enough to have or... a website. <laughs> no, I've got a raw, a raw milk herd chair. So as far as I know, I think I'm the longest running raw milk, raw goat milk herd chair in the state of Ohio. Um, it's been like eight or nine years. So basically, um, a herd share is sort of this workaround where you're not allowed to sell raw milk in Ohio, but gotcha. if people own an animal, they can drink the milk from it. So people buy into oh. my herd, they pay me a monthly boarding fee to take care of the animals, and then they are entitled to a certain percentage of milk based on how much of that herd they own, how many shares they bought in. That's fantastic. So, now do they have to be local so there? Well. They have to be a local local enough that yeah, they can they can get to me and pick up their milk and stuff. So right. they they have to physically go there in order to make that mm -hmm. work, right? You can't take it across borders or anything like that, right? No, technically you're not supposed to travel with raw milk across state lines. Yeah. It's all these rules. It's weird. I know. It's stupid. I know. <laughs> wow. That's, that's awesome. That's, so if anybody's in your area, is there, is there a way to contact you that you want to give out uh, or put in the description well, or is it all just, you know what, we're good. We got it. We got enough people that. Yes. Yes. And the season's about to end anyways, because uh, dairy goats are seasonal breeders. So okay. they start to dry up in the fall and then they'll um, start doing their boyfriend, girlfriend dance here pretty soon um and all babies in the spring but i i started grad school five weeks ago and oh, man, you're busy. i definitely cut the herd share down to, to very few people um because a 40 hour a week job on top of grad school on top of running a farm on top of being a parent yeah is a lot and um no i'm not taking any more members right now all right well <laughs> you mildly. heard it here folks sorry um Sorry. So, <laughs> so there was something I, I experienced back home and I've, and I've only and back home by back home. I mean, uh, in the Seattle area, that's where I moved from. And, um, I've only seen it once here, but I saw it a couple times over there. And that was a bunch of goats clearing land. Like basically they mm -hmm. fenced off a, an area and then they just put a bunch of goats in there and cleared land. Have you ever done that with your goats? I mean, that's all my goats do here. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, <laughs> so not, them out, I guess. No, not in the city. Um, 
for so for dairy goats i have to milk them once or twice every day if they mm -hmm. don't have their babies on them then it's twice a day so wow. that works really well for meat goats or for retired dairy moms that oh, gotcha. you know that you're like you You've done enough. You've given me enough babies. You're going to go just live the life and eat a bunch of stuff. Um, but it's also almost a full-time job in that not everyone realizes like there's still, there's still plants that are toxic to goats. Wow. So a, a goat herder would have to go in and sort of like double check to make sure there's nothing dangerous. There's nothing that's going to hurt them. Um, clear it out of any barbed wire have enough electronic fence to set it up make sure that either they're there or there's a livestock guardian dog or two there for overnight in case it's in a more wild area because you guys have like wolves and bears and shit like i have coyotes here but you've got mountain lions and things so <laughs> there's a lot more um there's a lot more predators out by you to worry about um but there's a lot that goes into it how are they going to get water every day because goats need yeah. water so it seems like a really easy thing and it could be if that was someone's entire deal right yeah, like that's yeah, what yeah. they were doing um but it's not just like an easy side job like everyone thinks it's gonna be because it i mean all, all animal all livestock care is a lot more intense than most people realize that's yeah, why getting just... into chickens is been easy for people um <laughs> but anything larger i mean yeah people, i don't think people realize how yeah, well, even chickens can be rough, right? You got to put them yeah. in every night so that a raccoon doesn't get them. Right, and you got to um, make sure you keep. But I don't think people realize how dedicated it. a livestock farmer has to be. So. Yeah, and I think people. But get... no, but. Go ahead. Yeah, but goats clearing the land is great. They're amazing for that. Um, I've yeah, I've seen a lot. Every time there's a video of it on Facebook, somebody sends it to me. So. Um, they do a fantastic job helping mitigate a lot of that um fire uh, wildfire tinder yeah on the understory of of forests i mean so, and we no we they should be used are getting yeah we're getting hammered it's like i, I know I don't understand i don't understand i mean we've it's cleared up and then so this is twice now it's cleared up but the smoke's back in so it's not as thick as it was before but so that's over a month that we've had you know some some of those days have been like you can't even see the foothills you know it's it's pretty it's pretty bad i can't um, even imagine we've had like thick fog here before but at least yeah. you can breathe in fog yeah i mean it's it's like the mask isn't enough <laughs> you know you know put on oh. your put on your painter's mask um so yeah so uh so i just wanted to i, I just wanted to give you an opportunity do you want is there a place where you post videos about or, or any information on your, your knowledge, your vast knowledge, or do people pretty much just have to, to come <laughs> I and mean, buy the, buy the program? I have an, I have an Instagram and a Facebook and that's about all I have time to manage. Unfortunately. Um, Instagram is mother of wolves with a period in between on either side of the of and end of the wolf and a mother of wolves 1111 or you can search my name and you'll probably find me but i do do a lot of herbal posts and things like that when i'm um throughout the season when i'm harvesting or growing i've got a pretty good um several raised bed um perennial herb garden but i've been going on three or four years now awesome since we've been at our new place here um and like i said i do a lot of just out in the woods wild crafting and out in the pasture because there's so much i'm so lucky in appalachia we've got you know the most biodiverse deciduous forests like on the planet and the highest wow. number of medicinal herbs anywhere so oh, wow. it's kind of an herbalist's paradise right where i'm at that's great yeah and we'll put we'll put those links in the description if you want to go check check out what sasha's got going well, thanks so much for Plus joining me in the brain. Spring. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Hit that bell so you know when we put new videos out. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Brain Aqua. This has been Aqua Brain TV. Remember to keep your head up and keep those knees bent.